Well, next we encounter the words, and by the Holy Spirit was incarnate of the Virgin Mary, which takes the place of the word born of the Virgin Mary. Uh, to be born describes the moment of birth, whereas to be incarnate describes the moment of conception. The word became incarnate, actually became flesh in Mary's womb. So that's a, an important distinction. And finally, we will now say the words, he suffered death and was buried and rose again on the third day in accordance with the scriptures. Uh, this phrase was also difficult to translate because the Latin word for suffered implies death. And in English, suffering uh, does not necessarily imply death. So as a result, we've been using two words, suffered and died. Well, now we're only going to use one verb, he suffered, while adding the word death to make it clear in the English that Jesus indeed did die. And finally, the word accordance with the scriptures is simply more precise than the word fulfillment of the scriptures. In the last part of the Nicene Creed, we profess our faith in the Holy Spirit and in the church. And you'll notice one change in reference to the Holy Spirit when we will say, with the Father and the Son is adored and glorified, which is a more precise translation of the Latin word worshipped and glorified. So adored and glorified. A little further down, you'll notice that instead of saying, we acknowledge one baptism, uh, we are now going to say, I confess one baptism. Uh, to confess means to express a belief in. It's a more forceful expression than to acknowledge. Uh, to confess is more powerful because it really involves the heart as well as the head, and something that the word acknowledge doesn't really express. And last but not least, for the creed, we're going to say the words, and I look forward to the resurrection of the dead instead of we look for. Uh, and that simply expresses much more eagerness as well as confidence that this is going to happen. Now, as I mentioned, there, uh, the wording of the Apostles' Creed has also changed, but because of the limits of time we have in this webinar, we're not going to explore the Apostles' Creed. Instead, I encourage you to visit the uh, the site, the bishop's site, um, usccb.org, uh, to take a look at the changes in the Apostles' Creed. But for now, let's go on to the Liturgy of the Eucharist and uh, take a look at some of the changes that are happening there. The first people's change that we're going to encounter in the Liturgy of the Eucharist is a, a very minor one. It's when we stand to pray the words, May the Lord accept the sacrifice at your hands. Um, we're simply going to be inserting the word holy when we refer to the church. And that's because that word appears in the Latin. And so this translation will now include that word. Uh, next comes what we call the preface dialogue. And here, once again, it begins with the priest saying, the Lord be with you, and our response, and with your spirit. But look how the rest of the re this exchange goes. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. And finally, our response, it is right and just. Uh, this is a good example of less is more. It's a, a simple declarative statement, almost like saying amen. Uh, we're just saying that to give thanks and praise is the way things are supposed to be. Um, now, one thing that can really help us in getting to know the new words is to, uh, to sing a part of the Mass. And, and this is a part of the Mass that is often sung, and I'm sure you recognize this melody. And so let me just go through this with you, and you can see how, uh, uh, how it feels when we do this. And so the, the priest beginning with, The Lord be with you and with your spirit. Lift up your hearts, we lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right and just. All right, Nick, I'm not going to sing anymore. That was it. But uh, there's 
a good example of a melody that will retain its familiarity, but the words will change. And so I think that's going to be helpful for us to maybe practice some of these by, by singing them. Um, next, after we uh, have the preface dialogue, we move on to the, the Sanctus, or the Holy Holy. And here there's only one change. Instead of saying God of power and might, we now say God of hosts. Now we need to know here what kind of hosts we're referring to. Uh, we're not referring to the host of a dinner party. and We're not referring to the hosts or, or the wafers that are used for Holy Communion. What we're referring to are the hosts of angels, the army of angels or invisible powers who work at God's command. And this is an example of a closer to connection to Scripture since this first line is drawn from Isaiah chapter 6, verse 3, describing Isaiah's vision in the temple. And so we're praising God who controls all forces and will soon be performing the miracle of transforming bread and wine into the body and blood of Jesus, something that only God can do. Now, up till now, we've been focusing on uh, primarily the people's parts, but I'd like to, to read you uh, part of the Eucharistic prayer. This is from Eucharistic prayer three. Uh, we're going to be listening to lots of new words. The priest will be saying new words, and it will be our job to listen. So give a listen to these words. You are indeed holy, O Lord, and all you have created rightly gives you praise. For through your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, by the power and working of the Holy Spirit, you give life to all things and make them holy, and you never cease to gather a people to yourself, so that from the rising of the sun to its setting, a pure sacrifice may be offered to your name. Notice how that uh, is a uh, wording. It's a little more formal. It's a little more poetic. It's a little more lofty. Uh, in particular, you notice that the change in the words, from age to age you gather a people to yourself so that from east to west the perfect offering may be made to the glory of your name. And now the priest says, you never cease to gather a people to yourself so that from the rising of the sun to its setting a pure sacrifice may be offered to your name. Uh, it's significant because uh, we recognize that the words east to west are a geographical description while the rising of the sun to its setting is a, a reference to time and not a geographical location. So that's kind of significant. Uh, very notable, notable are some of the changes in the words of the consecration or the institution narrative of the Eucharistic prayer. Take a look at this example from Eucharistic prayer 2. As the priest will say, at the time he was betrayed and entered willingly into his passion, he took bread and giving thanks, broke it and gave it to his disciples saying, take this all of you and eat of it for this is my body, which will be given up for you. So those words are slightly different from what we have been hearing. Um, but then the priest continues with the consecration of the wine. As he says, in a similar way, when supper was ended, he took the chalice and once more giving thanks. So a significant change here is uh, using the word chalice instead of cup. Um, this more closely connects with the name that we use to refer to the vessel that's used on the altar at the Mass. And it also connotes a, a more ceremonial or ritual vessel than does the word cup. And it also matches more uh, frequent uses of the word chalice in the Bible. Uh, another notable change here is the use of the words which will be poured out for you and for many. Instead of it will be shed for you and for all. Uh, first, it's important to note that Jesus didn't merely shed blood, but he poured it out for us. His death was something that he freely chose to do. But why are we saying that he did this for many instead of for all? It sounds almost like uh, we're being more exclusive. Well, the fact is that in Latin, the words pro multus have both an inclusive and an exclusive meaning. And that's not true for the, in English of the word many. The fact is that while Jesus' invitation is offered to all, not everyone will accept it. Uh, salvation is not 
automatic, but it requires our willing participation. So our hope is to be numbered among the many who choose to accept this gift. And another reason that uh, this word is being used is because in both Gospels of Matthew and Luke, uh, Jesus used the word many rather than all. So once again, we're being uh, truer to the scripture. Uh, immediately after the institution narrative, we proclaim the mystery of faith. And there's a couple of big changes here. Uh, first, the priest is no longer going to say, let us proclaim the mystery of faith. He now will simply announce the mystery of faith. Uh, a big reason for this is that uh, an acclamation is something that simply wells up with, uh, within us, and it just births, bursts forth uh, unsolicited. So we don't have to be invited to acclaim the mystery of faith. Uh, the priest will simply state the obvious, the mystery of faith. Uh, and then we have uh, several responses that we can make. But what's to be noted here is that we will no longer be using the acclamation, Christ has died, Christ has risen, Christ will come again. The reason is that um, these words, the words of the acclamation are, are to be uh, addressed directly to God. Uh, but as you can see, the words, Christ has died, Christ has risen, Christ will come again, do not address God. They, they talk about God. And so the bishops have chosen to simply use uh, the other proclamations, the other acclamations. As you can see on the screen, we proclaim your death, O Lord, and profess your resurrection until you come. Or when we eat this bread and drink this cup, we proclaim your death, O Lord, until you come again. And finally, save us, Savior of the world, for by your cross and resurrection, you have set us free. We move on to the sign of peace, and here the only difference is our response. When the priest says, the peace of the Lord be with you always, our response is, and with your spirit. Um, more significant uh, is going to be the invitation to Holy Communion where here the priest is going to say, Behold the Lamb of God, behold him who takes away the sins of the world. Um, these words are reminiscent of John the Baptist, who pointed out Jesus to his followers in John chapter 1, verse 29, saying, Behold the Lamb of God. Uh, and likewise, uh, blessed are those called to the supper of the Lamb, uh, or an allusion to the book of Revelation, chapter 19, verse 9, in which John describes a vision of the, the banquet of the Lamb. And then our response, when we say, Lord, I'm not worthy to receive you, we're now going to say, Lord, I'm not worthy that you should enter under my roof. And this is an allusion to Matthew, chapter 8, verse 8, and also Luke, chapter 7, verse 6, in which the centurion asks Jesus to heal his servant, but then says the words, Lord, I'm not worthy for you to enter under my roof, but only say the word and my servant shall be healed. And so as we change the words from I shall be healed to my soul shall be healed, this also more closely reflects the, the Latin and emphasizes that this is a, a spiritual food that we are receiving. And finally, now we come to the dismissal uh, in which we once again have the exchange of the Lord be with you and our response and with your spirit. But now we have three different ways, uh, or four actually, that the priest or deacon can dismiss us by saying, go forth, the Mass is ended. Go and announce the gospel of the... I'm sorry, go and announce the gospel of the Lord or go in peace, glorifying the Lord by your life, and finally, go in peace. And our response remains the same. Thanks be to God. It's interesting to note that Pope Benedict XVI inserted these changes himself, uh, wanting to bring a little bit more attention to the uh, dismissal of the Mass. Okay. We've gone through quite a bit, and we said that we uh, were going to take a few questions. We do have time to take two or three, and then I will answer the rest uh, on my blog. So, uh, Nick, uh, why don't you go ahead and uh, tell us what you came up with. 
All right, Joe, the first question we had from uh, several people tonight, actually, and they would like to know if the changes that we've been discussing this evening are going to be for all languages or just for English. Well, the third edition is being translated into all uh, different languages. However, English has the most changes because of the fact that our previous translation was more of a dynamic equivalent and now is going to be more formal. Most other major languages did a formal translation uh, after Vatican II, so their changes are much less significant. Uh, English has the most significant changes happening. Okay, Nick? All right, Joe, our second question here is from Lori, and she would like to know if you think the more formal language that we've been discussing this evening will be difficult for children to understand. Uh, to be honest, I, I think so. Uh, I think this is going to be a challenge for us. Um, I think we're going to have to help children to understand. Uh, there are different types of language, and that some language is more formal. But I, I think uh, we're going to have to be sensitive to this uh, and be very uh, watchful of how children and young people um, react. That's just my own personal uh, response is that I think this could be more difficult for children. But uh, you know, let, let's hope for the best and do our best to, to really work with them uh, to grasp these changes. Let's do one more, Nick. All right, Joe, again, we had a question here that uh, several people asked this evening, and they would like to know if there will be any changes to the lectionary as well. Uh, no, not at this time. There are, are no changes to the lectionary happening. This is all with the, the Roman Missal, which is why when we get to the Liturgy of the Word, um, as I mentioned, there really are not uh, many changes happening there until we get to after the homily and we start uh, with the, the creed uh, and experience lots of changes. But uh, otherwise, not, nothing happening with the, the lectionary. Uh, I want to tell you about some helpful resources uh, that uh, can be of assistance to you during this time of trans transition. Uh, the first one is uh, our Loyola Press uh, website. We have a series of uh, 10 articles on the Roman Missal changes that I have been writing with my uh, friend and uh, colleague, uh, Todd Williamson. So I invite you to visit uh, and see those 10 articles. Another website that you must visit if you want to know more about these changes is the official website of the United States Conference of Catholic Bishops, and that is usccb.org. Very important for you to visit that official site to see what is being offered. And then also, I have a PDF waiting for you on my blog as we speak. And so on, I invite you to go and visit my uh, blog and download a PDF of many other resources that I have chosen that I think can be of uh, great assistance to you. And I also want to take uh, an opportunity to tell you something I'm very excited about. It's uh, my next book that will be coming out in March of 2011 called Practice Makes Catholic, Moving from a Learned Faith to a Lived Faith. So that's going to be out in just about a month. And it's a book about the things that we do day in and day out that make us Catholic. Um, it's about how to shape our Catholic identity so that we know what it means to be a practicing Catholic on days other than Sunday when we go to Mass. So you can pre-order the book by visiting the Loyola Press website. Well, I would like to uh, give great thanks to uh, Nick and uh, Carrie who have been here helping me out uh, throughout this webinar, to all of the good people here at Loyola Press for making this possible, and to all of you for participating. And I'd like to conclude by simply offering praise to God as together we say, Glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit as it was in the beginning, is now and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. Thank you very much, and God bless you, and good night.